The Zulu Kingdom was one of the most powerful and significant kingdoms in African history. Its rise and fall tells a compelling story about the continent's past. And yet, even today, few people outside Africa know their story. So let's change that, take a journey through history and discover the fascinating story of the Zulu people. Hi, my name is Sebastian and you're watching 7 Facts. The Zulu people, a Bantu nation, are believed to have migrated southward from the Great Lakes region around the 16th century, settling in the area of today's KwaZulu-Natal province in South Africa. KwaZulu was established in 1574 by Zulu Ka Malandela, son of King Malandela of the Ngunis. When Malandela died, his youngest son founded the Zulu clan while his eldest, Kwabe, founded his own much larger clan. Other Ngunis are the Swazi, Kosa or the Ndebele, but the most notable of them are still the Zulu. Over time, they developed a unique culture and language that set them apart from the other groups in the region. They established small chiefdoms and were generally the dominant group of the area. Even today, they are the largest ethnic group in South Africa with an estimated 10 to 12 million people, living mainly in KwaZulu-Natal. But they didn't rise to prominence until the 19th century. That's when a single person managed to bring the clans together, built a cohesive identity for the nation and became a military power of the region. That man was Shaka Zulu, and under his leadership, the Zulu kingdom grew in power and expanded its territory through a series of military campaigns. Shaka is widely regarded as one of the greatest military leaders in African history and his legacy is still celebrated in South Africa today. However, the rise of European colonization in the late 19th century brought significant changes to the region and ultimately led to the decline of the Zulu kingdom. Shaka was born in 1787, the illegitimate son of the Zulu chief Senzaga Kona. He grew up in a time of great instability and conflict among the various Zulu clans and he quickly distinguished himself as a skilled warrior and strategist. In 1816, Shaka became the leader of the Zulu people after his father's death. He immediately set about consolidating power and expanding the Zulu kingdom through a series of military campaigns. He reorganized the Zulu military into regiments, each with its own distinctive uniform and weapons, and he introduced new tactics that made the Zulu army almost unbeatable on the battlefield. Under Shaka's leadership, the Zulu kingdom became a dominant force in southern Africa with a highly centralized political system and a strong military presence. Shaka's military conquest brought large territories under Zulu control and he also encouraged the assimilation of conquered peoples into Zulu culture. However, Shaka's rule was not without controversy. He was known for his harsh treatment of his subjects and he was responsible for the deaths of thousands of people during his reign. He was also highly suspicious of outsiders and discouraged any contact with Europeans which would later have significant consequences for the Zulu kingdom. Shaka Ka Senzagakona, King Shaka for short, did have royal blood and was not a commoner. He was the son of King Senzankagona Kajama, but as I said, he was an illegitimate son. So he spent his childhood in his mother's settlements where he was initiated into an Ibuto Lembi, a fighting unit serving as a warrior. His father died in 1816 and Shaka's younger half-brother, Sikujana, took power. But that wasn't gonna fly with Shaka, who was lent a regiment from his mentor and lord of the Zulus, Dingiswayo, and was able to put his brother to death. Shaka's coup was successful, but he remained a vassal to Dingiswano for about a year that is, because Dingiswano was killed in battle and Shaka filled in the power vacuum. In the initial years, Shaka had neither the influence nor reputation to compel any but the smallest of groups to join him. But as Chaka became more respected by his people, he was able to spread his ideas with greater ease. Because of his background as a soldier, Chaka taught the Zulus that the most effective way of becoming powerful quickly was by conquering and controlling other tribes. The Zulu tribe soon developed a warrior outlook, which Chaka turned to his advantage. Chaka's innate talent for strategy meant that the Zulu was about to become a force to be reckoned with. He was a military genius who revolutionized warfare in southern Africa. 
He introduced new tactics and innovations, such as the short-stabbing spear and the bullhorn formation, which involved surrounding and overwhelming the enemy from all sides. This newfound military might helped the Zulu Kingdom expand its territory rapidly, and under Shaka's leadership, the Zulu Kingdom became a dominant force in the region. One of Shaka's key innovations was the creation of a highly disciplined and organized military force. He introduced regiments, uniforms and specialized weapons, and also a new system of military training that emphasized discipline and obedience. If these sound familiar, they should. These are some of the pillars of any modern army, although it has to be mentioned. Shaka didn't learn these tactics, he came up with them and implemented them on his own. Not everyone agrees on this by the way, and there are some who believe that he was a borrower, not an innovator. Regardless, in addition to his military innovations, Shaka was also known for his social and political reforms. He introduced a new system of governance that was highly centralized and hierarchical, with himself, of course, as the supreme leader. He also encouraged the assimilation of conquered peoples into Zulu culture, which helped to strengthen the unity of the kingdom, although this is also where the controversies begin. Shaka was known for his harsh treatment of his subjects and his ruthless suppression of dissent. Thousands may have died, but his tactics worked and his power in the kingdom was unequaled. As I said, Shaka discouraged any contact with Europeans. He didn't trust them and generally believed that European tactics and technology were, for the most part, beneath the Zulu ways. However, he did grant permission to Europeans to enter Zulu territory on rare occasions. In the mid-1820s, Henry Francis Finn provided medical treatment to the king after an assassination attempt by a rival tribe member hidden in a crowd. To show his gratitude, Shaka permitted European settlers to enter and operate in the Zulu kingdom. His demise, though, wouldn't come from the Europeans, but from his own people. His conquests and strict behavior gave Shaka enough enemies among his own people to hasten his demise. But it was his mother's death, Nandi, in 1827 that made Shaka lose it. Struck down by grief, Shaka became erratic and caused immense devastation. He ordered that no crops should be planted during the following year of mourning, no milk, which was the basis of the Zulu diet at the time, was to be used, and any woman who became pregnant was to be killed along with her husband. Cows were also slaughtered so that their calves would know what losing a mother felt like. Yeah, I told you, he lost it. At least 7,000 people who were deemed to be insufficiently grief-stricken were executed. Three assassins, two of them his half-brothers, set out to kill him and sometime in 1827, he was killed. Shaka's death wasn't the end of the Zulu kingdom. The state would last until 1897. Unfortunately, the Zulu's rise to power coincided with the scramble for Africa, the invasion, annexation, division and colonization of most of Africa by seven Western European powers. Just like in the rest of the continent, the arrival of the Europeans was bad news for the locals. In the late 19th century, European colonizers arrived in South Africa and began to encroach on Zulu territory. This led to the Anglo-Zulu War of 1879, which ended in the defeat of the Zulu Kingdom by British forces. The Zulu Kingdom was annexed by the British Empire and its power was greatly diminished. The British introduced a new system of governance and land ownership, which disrupted traditional Zulu social structures and led to widespread poverty and unrest. Despite this defeat, the Zulu people continued to resist colonial rule. There were several uprisings against British authority, including the Bambatha Rebellion in 1906, which was led by a Zulu chief named Bambatha Kamansinza. Although the rebellion during the years of the apartheid in South Africa, the government attempted to suppress traditional African cultures and promote European customs. As part of the apartheid, Bantustans were created, territories that the National Party Administration of South Africa set aside for black inhabitants. KwaZulu was such a place, an incontiguous semi-independent territory meant to divide and conquer. It was disbanded in 1994 when KwaZulu was merged with the surrounding South African province of Natal to form the new province of KwaZulu-Natal. 
It's been over a hundred years since the Zulu Kingdom has disappeared and the Zulu nation was almost continuously suppressed since then. And yet, their culture, traditions, arts and beliefs continue to exist to this day. The core of Zulu heritage has been passed down through generations and is alive and well. Music, dance and storytelling are integral components of that culture, with each having its unique purpose and significance. For example, music is used to celebrate important occasions such as weddings, funerals and coming-of-age ceremonies, while dance is used to express emotions and communicate with ancestors. Storytelling is also an essential part of Zulu culture, with tales often used to teach moral lessons and preserve history. Zulu art and craft are also highly regarded in African art history, with intricate beadwork, basketry and pottery being just a few examples of the beautiful and unique creations that have come out of the Zulu nation. In the 21st century, Zulu culture continues to thrive, but it also faces challenges. One of the most significant challenges is the erosion of traditional values and practices due to modernization and globalization. Younger generations may be less inclined to participate in traditional ceremonies and practices, preferring instead to embrace modern lifestyles and values. Despite these challenges, Zulu culture remains a source of pride and identity for many people. Its rich traditions, customs and beliefs continue to inspire and shape the lives of those who identify with it and its legacy will undoubtedly continue to influence African history and culture for generations to come. I hope this video was interesting enough to have inspired you to look into it further on your own. If you liked it, leave a like and subscribe. You can leave your comments downstairs and you can also check out my Patreon page if you want to support me. I do hope to see you next time. Bye.